If you want to look jacked, you need big shoulders. By the end of this video, I'll give you the best exercises to do so for each head of the deltoids. Before I can rank each exercise for shoulder growth, you need to understand what the different heads of the shoulders are. While you can subdivide the shoulders even further, we can group the shoulder musculature into anterior or front deltoid, lateral or side deltoid, and posterior or rear deltoid. The front and side deltoid, for example, or delt for short, do share some functions, but for sake of ease, we'll divide each section of the delt into its own tier list. I'll be ranking exercises by these criteria by and large. Let's start with exercises that primarily target the front delt. The front delt is primarily responsible for shoulder flexion like a front raise and shoulder abduction like a lateral raise. Let's start with the standing barbell overhead press. Mike Isretel has ranked the barbell overhead press into D tier, but I disagree. Don't get me wrong, the barbell overhead press isn't the greatest front delt exercise. It involves a lot of stabilization by the lower body and core, takes a while to warm up for, and doesn't provide a full stretch on the front delts. To get a deeper, potentially maximal stretch on the front delts, we would want to get our arm behind us, which we don't achieve during the overhead press. However, the barbell overhead press does provide a good stretch on the front and side delts and has a good amount of resistance in that stretch position. On top of that, and I think this is a hot take, I think the barbell overhead press probably trains the side delts reasonably well. The movement of the humerus during the movement is mostly abduction, which your side delts are responsible for. In fact, anyone making strong claims as to whether a shoulder exercise targets a specific head of the deltoids is either relying on generalizable criteria, as I am here, or mistakenly over relying on EMG research. The truth is, we just don't have any direct evidence on deltoid hypertrophy yet, though my colleagues and I are working on the first ever study on the side delts, comparing the dumbbell side raise to the cable side raise and measuring side delt hypertrophy. At any rate, into mid B tier, the standing barbell overhead press goes. If we sit down on a bench and do the exact same motion, we remove the stabilization required by the core and lower body, reducing fatigue and making it more likely the shoulders reach failure. However, setting this up can take some additional time. Low A tier for the seated barbell overhead press. The standing or seated dumbbell overhead presses are similar movements. What you gain in time not spent loading up a barbell, you trade off in difficulty getting the dumbbells into position, especially for the standing dumbbell overhead press. You can make up for this by going slightly lighter and higher in reps though. So mid A tier for the seated dumbbell overhead press and low B tier for the standing dumbbell overhead press. If you switch to a single dumbbell instead, you have a classic lift, the standing single arm dumbbell overhead press, aka circus dumbbell lift. This is still a staple in strongman to this day. It's a bit easier to get this into position, but the single arm aspect means it takes a bit more time and introduces a rotational component, involving your obese a bit more than usual. Despite all of that, it's a bit easier to brace for and it's a fun lift. So into low A tier. There are at least two front delt exercises we can use to circumvent the issues of getting the dumbbells into position and the stabilization of a standing overhead press. First, the seated Smith machine overhead press. It's stable, there's no difficulty starting the set and it makes it very easy to push to failure safely. Top of A tier. However, this exercise still has a time sink of loading up a barbell. Enter the machine overhead press. All the benefits just mentioned, plus just selecting the weight and starting the set. The only reason I can't put this into S tier is because not everyone has this machine. And even if you do, machines vary widely. So into high A tier it goes, just below the Smith machine overhead press. To wrap up our overhead pressing section, there are three exercises I think are somewhat slept on. The behind the neck press, the Bradford press, and the dip, which is not an overhead press. The behind the neck press shares many similarities with the standing overhead press. The only difference is that you press the bar from a back squat position, which makes the movement more similar to a lateral raise type motion, potentially involving your side delts more. At the same time, more people struggle with this movement than the regular barbell overhead press, both in terms of technique and in terms of joint discomfort. Give it a shot and see how you like it. Mid B tier. Next, the Bradford press. The Bradford press is essentially a bastardized length and partial on the barbell overhead press. You spend the whole lift in a relatively stretched position and train under constant tension. However, it can be awkward to stabilize and I'm personally not a huge fan of having a barbell inching incrementally closer to smashing my skull. High B tier. Finally, dips. 
while not traditionally thought of as a shoulder exercise, and they're not really, they do a phenomenal job of stretching out the front delts under load. At the bottom of a deep dip, you get a deeper stretch on the front delt than virtually any other exercise. The downside, the pecs and triceps can easily give out before your front delts first, and there's a lot of stabilization required. For the front delts into mid A tier. Finally, we have isolation movements for the front delts. First, the barbell front raise. Popularized by Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think this is one of the least useful movements you can do. Loading up a barbell takes extra time, free weights offer next to no resistance in the stretch position, and you don't even get into a particularly stretch position for your front delts in the first place. You also need to stabilize the lift since you're standing. Your front delts already get a lot of love from compound movements like benching, overhead pressing, and doing dips which makes front raises a bit more redundant in general. As we'll get into in just a moment, there are better front delt isolation exercises too. Into high detail. Moving up in tiers, we have the dumbbell front raise. It has the same limitations as the barbell front raise, but if only because it cuts down on the time taken to load up a barbell into low C tier. Let's have a sit down instead. The incline dumbbell front raise. This exercise accomplishes two things above the standing front raise. First, it allows your arms to go past your torso, getting a deeper stretch on your front delts. Instead of having peak resistance at 90 degrees of shoulder flexion, peak resistance now occurs in a much more stretched position. Finally, sitting down removes some of the stabilization required. High B tip. For our top pick for front delt isolation work, we have the cable front raise. It provides a greater stretch on the front delt, just like the incline raise, but with more resistance in the stretch than the incline dumbbell front raise. If you set the cables a little bit higher, you can increase this even further, mid A tip. If you'd like to streamline the training process and take not just your shoulder training, but all of your training to the next level, check out MyAdapt. MyAdapt is a coach in your pocket, designed by exercise scientists and being updated with new research constantly. MyAdapt ranks exercises based on the scientific evidence in terms of effectiveness for you, based on your goal and time availability. It gives you S-tier exercises, so you can gain as much muscle as possible. It creates a program individualized to you. Go to myadapt.com and sign up to be notified when it launches. You'll be able to lock in at a lower price than any other time. On to side delts. Let's start with the most popular side delt exercise, the lateral raise. The lateral raise trains the side delts through their primary function, namely shoulder abduction. The side delts perform both shoulder abduction and shoulder flexion along with the front delts and upper pecs. However, since they're the primary muscle responsible for shoulder abduction, we should primarily target them through this function. Notably, they also perform shoulder transverse abduction along with rear delts. The lateral raise combines the side delt's primary function, shoulder abduction, with some scapular elevation involving the upper traps and levator scapula. Since it mostly isolates the side delts, it takes them close to failure. Since it uses dumbbells and no other equipment, it's convenient and fairly time efficient. However, in my opinion, it's overused. It has quite a few drawbacks. For one, it's pretty poor at loading the side delts in the stretch position. There's no resistance in the stretch and the lift effectively ends when your upper arms are perpendicular to the ground. Even if you do partials to overcome this, it's an uphill battle. Just like a resistance band, the resistance will still be lowest in the stretch and highest in the contraction. There's also a fair bit of stabilization required compared to other alternatives. So for the side delts, it goes into high C tier. What about the leaning in lateral raise? Doesn't that increase the stretch? Well, actually, no. The lift starts with your arm out a bit more, shortening the side delt. It essentially turns into an even more contraction-focused exercise while forcing you to do one arm at a time. It's also low-key hard for your forearms to stabilize your body. As Jeff Nippert pointed out recently, the leaning away lateral raise is better. It essentially reverses the dynamics. You can now bring your arm across your body under some resistance, getting a bit more stretch under load. The resistance also increases in the stretch compared to a traditional side raise. However, it doesn't do a great job of this. It only shifts the emphasis slightly. Let's push for A tier, the machine lateral raise. It allows you to train both arms at the same time, is a quick plug and play exercise, and loads the stretch position more than a free weight side raise. What stops it from being S tier? Availability and variability. A good lateral raise machine is rare, but worth its weight in gold. Low A tier. 
Here are two S tier ladder arrays variations nearly everyone does have access to. Cable ladder arrays and the line slide arrays. Cable ladder arrays does a lot of things right. It lets your arm come across the body, providing a greater stretch on the side delt. If you set it up at hand height, it also maximizes the resistance in the deep stretch, which probably helps you build more muscle. Its only real downsides, there is some stabilization involved you need to train one arm at a time, and it can be tricky getting a cable in a busy gym. High S tier. Finally, the lying side raise. It provides the same benefits as the cable side raise. More stretch by letting the arm come across the body, and maximum resistance when the upper arm is parallel to the ground, when the side delt is in a deep stretch. The downside? It requires you to do one arm at a time, and it requires a free bench. However, in my opinion, those are small downsides into S2. A much less popular side delta exercise is the upright row. First, the barbell upright row. This lift, in my honest opinion, has more downsides than upsides. It's minimally resisted in the stretch, doesn't really stretch the side delts, requires you to spend time loading up a barbell. For what it's worth, this can be a bit iffy on some people's shoulders too, though your mileage may vary. I can't think of many worse side delt exercises, bar maybe the lean in ladder raise. Low C tail. The dumbbell upright row improves on this slightly via greater time efficiency, helping to remedy imbalances and freedom of positioning. You're not locked into a barbell, which can cause some wrist discomfort for some people. High C tip. Cable upright rows add a bit more resistance in the stretch position, into low B tip. In general, although upright rows allow you to get some bicep and elbow flexor training in, they're probably worse than ladder raises and should be used rarely and mostly for variation or when you're trying to kill many birds with one stone. That covers the front and side delts. Let's cover the rear delts functions. The rear delt is primarily responsible for transverse abduction and to a lesser extent, regular abduction of the shoulder alongside the side delts. They can also contribute to shoulder extension, meaning that they get trained reasonably well during most vertical pulling movements. For the rear delts, the most commonly performed exercise is the bent over rear delt dumbbell fly. Unfortunately, this movement just has a ton of downsides for no apparent upsides. It does isolate the rear delts, since it moves your arms through transverse abduction. However, it has you bending over, which creates additional fatigue for no clear benefit. It provides no resistance in the bottom position. Worse yet, the bottom position of the movement doesn't even stretch the rear delts that much, which is probably why you don't feel anything in your rear delts at the bottom. This lift is also very easy to cheat. For all those reasons, bottom of detail. The compound movement equivalent of this exercise is the bent over dumbbell or barbell face pull. Both suffer the same limitations as the bent over rear delt dumbbell fly, but at least serve as a decent all around compound movement that trained rear delt somewhat well, the biceps somewhat well, and even the upper back somewhat well, into low C tear. The cable face pull is a marked improvement from this. You're no longer bending over, and you might get some additional resistance in the stretch, into low B tear. The machine rear delt fly is an even better exercise. You isolate the rear delts, raising the likelihood of a solid stimulus for the rear delts. The stretch position gets loaded more heavily, and you get to sit down, removing some of the stabilization requirements. Win-win. High beta. In my opinion, the single best compound movement for the rear delt is a cable face pull, rotating away from the cable stack. By letting your arm come across the torso, you get a much deeper stretch. The only downside is that you have to do one arm at a time, it doesn't isolate the rear delts, and it can be a little tricky to stabilize. Mid A tier. Remove the stabilization component, make it an isolation lift, and you have Jeff Nippert's variation of the rear delt machine fly. Top of A tier, great exercise. But I can do you one better. What if we could increase the resistance in the stretch and train both arms at the same time? Enter the rear delt cable crossover. The only downsides I can think of to this exercise are finding two free cables and the minor annoyance of two cables touching you, and finally getting rear delts so big it makes your front delts look small. You're welcome. But hey, before I give you a bonus tip, you can always make up for small shoulders by wearing the nicest gym designs out there at Rascal Apparel, the most durable and comfortable training clothing I've ever used too. Use code WOLF at checkout for 10% off and support me in the process. Bonus tip, incorporate one rear delt, one front delt, and two to three side delt exercises into your weekly routine as a great starting point. This is because your front and rear delts get some love during compound movements.
Your side doubts, not so much. Here's some of my top picks. Wolf Coaching, Deltoids, peace.